بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to the fiqh class and the beginning of the second semester of the second year we've reached section 6 of the book of prayer in our book Bidayatul Mujtahid and in this section we will start with the issue of the Imam and the followers. Now we know in the congregational prayer, which we already discussed the ruling of it, there is the Imam and there are the followers. Now what can the Imam perform on behalf of the followers? What we mean by that, something that the followers did not do, yet their prayer is still valid since they are following the Imam. What we will discuss here is the recitation. And this is a famous issue where scholars disagreed about the recitation. What is this issue exactly? You as an Imam leading the prayer, be it Dhuhr prayer, Asr prayer, Maghrib prayer or Aisha, or subh, any prayer. And you have a follower. So one of you is the imam and one of you is the follower. As a follower, do you recite or you do not recite? That's the issue that we're discussing. In another term, is the imam or is the recitation of the imam sufficient or you have to recite? That's the issue that we're discussing. Before that, we need to mention that scholars agreed that the Imam does not perform any of the pillars or obligatories on behalf of the ma'mum, of the follower. Like what? Someone came to the prayer behind the Imam and he did not perform wudu. Do we say since the Imam performed wudu, it is enough for you? You don't have to perform wudu? No. The Imam is leading the prayer. He stood up, he said, Allahu Akbar. You as a mamum said, Allahu Akbar. He recited Fatiha, another surah. Then he performed ruku. You did not perform ruku. You said, I will go straight to the sujood, shortcut. The imam made the ruku. Is that sufficient? Or you have to make the ruku? You have. So the same thing. Why then they disagreed about the recitation? Because the recitation itself, there is difference. Is it a pillar or not? Is it a pillar or not? Some scholars differentiated between the prayer that is recited aloud and the prayer that is recited silently. Like the case of Dhuhr prayer and Subh, for instance, or Isha. Some scholars differed between what you hear and what you don't hear, regardless whether the Imam said it aloud or it is a silent prayer. So again, basically, what's, what are the opinions? Or what do you do usually? Now this is the purpose. We're studying to learn and to apply. What do you do in Dhuhr prayer? If you are not the Imam, do you recite or you don't recite? What do you recite? Hmm? Fatiha and some surah. Maghrib, what do you do? You stay quiet. What do you do? I'm asking you. You stay quiet. You listen. That's not the opinion of the majority. Or actually here we may not have majority. It is like three-way difference. We have three opinions. One opinion says as long as the Imam is reciting, you do what? You just listen. Another opinion says you listen all the time. So the recitation is, is not a pillar. 
the recitation of the imam is enough. Another opinion says, you listen all the time, but with Al-Fatiha. And that's what I believe is the correct opinion. You have to recite Al-Fatiha all the time. Why? What's the evidence? Now, why we have this issue? Why we have these differences? Because we have conflict of a hadith. Apparent conflict. There is no conflict, but that's what it seems. One hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, Was there anyone reciting behind me? And one companion said, Yes. He said, Don't do it. For the, the recitation became mixed. I started feeling that I'm making mistakes. That's what the Prophet ﷺ said. So in this hadith, he said what? Do not recite. Which implies, don't recite, you just listen. In another hadith also, the Prophet ﷺ said, do not recite behind the Imam, for his recitation is sufficient for you. Which again implies that you don't need to recite behind him. His recitation is sufficient. Well, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, Quran, when the Qur'an is recited, what do you do? You listen. All scholars agree that it implies first hand in the prayer, before any other place. So if you hear the recitation in the prayer, what do you do? You listen. So how we say, or how I believe that the strongest opinion is to recite with Al-Fatiha. Because the Prophet ﷺ in one hadith specifically mentioned Surah Al-Fatiha. Do not recite behind your Imam, except with Al-Fatiha. For there is no prayer for the one who does not recite Al-Fatiha. That's very specific. And again, we don't have contradiction. We say in general, you listen. This applies, that's the implication of the ayah. Again, implication of the hadith. The imam is reciting, you listen. That's general, but there is a specific case with Al-Fatiha. Every prayer that you don't recite Al-Fatiha is incomplete. Prophet ﷺ did not distinguish between the imam and the follower. So, you recite Al-Fatiha. But, again, there, there is difference of opinions. Everyone has an evidence. And we have the issue in the book. You can read it, inshallah. Now, another thing which affects the ma'moom, the followers, the muqtadi, the one who is behind the imam. Now, we said if the ma'moom did not recite, according to some scholars, even al-fatiha, it is sufficient for the imam if he recited it. What if it's the opposite? The imam did something wrong. Does that affect the prayer of the ma'moom? Does it invalidate the prayer of the ma'moom? What we will discuss in particular, the hadith. The imam prayed with janaba. Now when you pray, do you have to have wudu or not? Of course, you have to have wudu. You prayed without wudu. Is your prayer correct or incorrect? Incorrect. What if you are the imam? Hmm? He's. What about you? Didn't the Prophet ﷺ say the Imam is only appointed to be followed? You follow him. So you are a follower of the Imam. The prayer of the Imam is incorrect. Your prayer is correct. What do you think? Some scholars differentiated. Did the Imam know of his hadith or no? They said if he knew and he told the Ma'moom, then their prayer is incorrect. But if they did not know, then their prayer is correct. Now, what case are we discussing in particular? If the Imam, during the prayer, and it happens, it happened to me, it could happen, you go, and you think you have wudu, and in the middle of the prayer you remember. And shaitan is very smart, he comes in that time and he tells you, Oh, you did not have wudu, I got you. What do you do? Do you keep going? 
You cannot. You cannot. So what if you stopped? What happens to the ma'mum? In general, in this case, you should tell one of the followers to continue. And scholars agreed this prayer is correct. Or even if you, if you just left the prayer, they, some scholars said they can continue by themselves. Their prayer is valid. The issue is when the prayer is finished, the shaitan let you finish your prayer. After you finish the prayer, he told you, you did not pray with wudu, or you had janaba last night, today before you come to the prayer, and you prayed with wudu only, you should have had ghusl. What do you do in this case? Your prayer is incorrect. You have to repeat it. There is no question. What about the ma'mum? Now, if you don't tell them, they agreed that it is correct. Their prayer is correct because they did not know. But if you told them, some scholars said in this case they have to repeat the prayer. Other scholars said no. Again, we have difference of opinions. Why? Because it also happened during the time of the Messenger wasallam. One time, he told them, he started the prayer, Allahu Akbar, and then he remembered. So he told them to wait. The people were waiting until he went, he performed ghusl, and he came and he continued the prayer. Now from this hadith, you may say, the prayer of the ma'mumin is incorrect. <coughs> Otherwise, they were allowed to continue the prayer. But others may say, no. Imagine nowadays, if an imam told the people to wait, what will happen to them? They will beat him up. They won't listen to him. You want us to wait? They wait by the dot. It's six o'clock sharp, that's it. Let's pray. They don't care after the prayer to talk half an hour, one hour, but if it's the beginning of the prayer, you have to start on time. We don't have enough time. Let's finish. So what do you do? Based on the hadith, the general hadith, the prayer of the mamum is a follow-up of the imam. Or the imam is the leader. If the leader lost his prayer, shouldn't you lose your prayer also? So this is, this is the issue that we are discussing. And let's read it from the book quickly. Yeah, we are in section 6. Page 173. Go ahead. Section 7. This is the validating the prayer for Imam and extending the validating the validity of the prayer of the Father. Wait. Online. Do you all have the book? Can you hear him? Okay, go ahead. They agree that if he, the imam, is suddenly overcome by peda, like releasing wind during prayer and stop, the prayer of the followers is not invalidated. They continue individually, or one of them steps forward and leads them. Yeah, that's, that's permissible. This is okay. They disagreed over the case where the imam leads them in prayer in a state of ritual impurity, and they come to know of this after the prayer. A group of jurors said that their prayer is valid, while another group said that their prayer is invalid. A third group made a distinction on the basis of whether the imam was aware of his sexual defilement or was ignorant of it. It doesn't have to be sexual defilement. It could be any hadith. They said that if he was aware of it, their prayer is invalid. But if he was unaware of their prayer, of it, their prayer is not invalid. No, no, again. If he was aware of it, their prayer is... They said that if he was aware of it, their prayer is invalidated. Uh -huh. But if he was unaware of it, their prayer is not invalidated. Okay, yeah. The first opinion was held by a shafi, and the second by a Hanifi, while the third was held by a man. Yeah, so how many opinions do we have? Three. What's the reason of this agreement? That's what we need to know. <coughs> the reason for the disagreement derives from the dispute over whether the validity of the followers' prayer is dependent upon the validity of the imam's prayer. Those who did not 
considered it to be dependent said that prayer is valid, while those who considered it to be dependent said that their prayer is, is invalidated. Okay. Uh, you need to uh, speak louder. Go ahead. Those who. Those who made a distinction between the forgetfulness and the intentional silence took into account the apparent meaning of the preceding tradition, which says that the Prophet ﷺ announced the takbir in one of his prayers and then interrupting his prayer, gestured to the people that they should wait. He went away, and on his return, there were remnants of moisture on his body. The apparent, the apparent meaning of this is that they continued their prayer, building upon the part they prayed before the Prophet. What does, what does that mean? Now again, this is very important. When the Prophet ﷺ came back, did they start over or they continued? They continued. So does that mean the previous part of the prayer, which is the takbir, was invalidated or was correct? It was correct, which implies that if they continued, it is correct. You cannot separate. It is the same prayer. If you say the first part is correct, this should be also correct. Go ahead. The apparent meaning of this is that they continued their prayer, building upon the part they prayed before the Prophet oh, so his prayer. A Shafi, supporting this ruling, argued that had their prayer been dependent upon his prayer, they would certainly have recommended the prayer with their first takbir. What do you think of this? Now that's the opinion of Imam Shafi, rahimahullah. Now some say no. Their prayer was dependent on his prayer. That's why they waited until he came back. So what do you think? Hmm? Strong opinion. No? Okay. Because he's leaving the Salah. Yeah. And they're following. They made the idea to follow him. To follow him, yeah. So he knows the way he come back, they're waiting because their prayer is dependent. What if they, not, if they did not wait? That's the question. Now they say their prayer is invalid. But if they waited, their prayer is valid. So what about the previous part? That's where you know the consistency, which opinion is stronger. If you say their prayer, if they continued, is invalid, that means from the beginning it's invalid. So they have to start over, which they did not. Yes. It's valid only if the imam comes back, and that's very, very troublesome. What's the evidence for that? So there's two scenarios. One, that the Prophet left, and then they continue the prayer. So the first part is valid. And then the only time it became valid was because the Prophet came back. So does it pertain to the Prophet himself as, as the Messenger of Allah, or it is for the imam? You, you, you assign someone else to become the imam. What's the evidence that it is exclusive for this imam in particular that you started the prayer with? Because he's the messenger of Allah. Yeah, again, again, this is, this is the, the issue. So you have the evidences, you have the differences and the reason for that. Now, we're moving to another topic, which is also still congregational prayer. But this one is very important, the Friday prayer, Salatul Jumu'ah. And I hope all of you know all these rulings about Salatul Jumu'ah. Because every week we have these issues. We will discuss first the obligation of the Jum'ah. Then, inshallah, we will discuss the conditions of Jum'ah. Then, we will discuss the pillars of Jum'ah. The rulings of Jum'ah. So, we have mainly four segments. Pertain to Salat al-Jum'ah. First thing, the obligation of Jum'ah. What's the ruling of Salat al-Jum'ah? Fard. Hmm? Is it mandatory? Is it recommended? Is it permissible? Fard for males who 
are sane and reach the age of puberty? What's the evidence? And resident. Healthy. Healthy. Not slave. That's not, that's not, I mean, you have to be precise in your... In principle, is it fard or sunnah or allowed or mandatory? Why? That's not enough. Tell me an evidence. This is the evidence. And it's not even enough to mention the evidence. You need to tell me what's the point in this evidence. Don't read from the book. Okay, fine, that's the ayah. If it was called for the prayer on the day of Friday, what is the evidence? What is the evidence? Fas'aw ila dhikrillah. Hasten to the remembrance of Allah. That's a command. Commands necessitate what? Obligation. Which means the prayer is obliga obligatory. So, this is an evidence that Salatul Jum'ah is what? Obligatory. What about Fard Kifaya? Some say, no, it is not obligatory. It has to be done, but not upon every individual. Just like Salatul Jama'ah. If some people did it, then it is sufficient. I'm not individually entitled to do Salat Al Jum'ah. What about this? What do you think? It's a general command. How many obligatory prayers do we have every day? Five. Now you say six? You don't do dhuhr. That's another issue. Is it replacement of dhuhr or it's a special prayer? Or it is both? Okay. That's another issue. Exactly. This command did not exclude anyone. So it is for everyone. This is a very important issue because, again, many people, especially nowadays, they will tell you, I don't have to come for Jum'ah. Please read the issue. The obligation. Raise your voice. Okay, so again, they both agreed. This, this is the opinion of the majority. First, it is obligation. And second, it is replacement of vuhr. And also because of the apparent meaning of the words of the exalted, O ye who believe, when the call is heard for the prayer of the day of the congregation, haste unto remembrance of Allah and leave your training. That is better for you if you did not, if you did but know. The command here necessitates an obligation. Further, because of the words of the Prophet Sallallahu let people desist from neglecting the Friday prayers, or Allah will stamp their heart. Exactly. What will happen if you don't come to the Friday prayer? Allah will stamp your heart. What is this? Is this a punishment or reward? To have your heart stamped. Punishment. Are you punished for leaving something recommended or obligatory? You're only blameworthy, you deserve punishment when you leave something obligatory. So the hadith of the Messenger وسلم, implies the obligation of Friday prayer. Another hadith, the Prophet وسلم, said, whoever left three consecutive Jum'as, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will stamp his heart. Okay. A group of jurors maintain that it is a communal obligation for Kifar. And from Malik, there is an isolated opinion that it is a sin. See, this is what the word I like to be mentioned, isolated. It is odd opinion, instead of saying deviant opinion, as it was mentioned before. Isolated opinion, that's better. The reason for the, this disagreement stems <coughs> from its similarity of the deed prayer, because of the words of the, or the words of the words. Yeah, here you need to cross out of the words, it is repeated. 
because of the words of the words. <laughs> it is one time only. Because of the words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This day has been determined to be an Eid by Allah. Okay, you understand here why, why they differed? Why some scholars said it is not mandatory? No. What about Eid? Some said mandatory. Exactly, for those who did not say. So since Jum'ah also is Eid, weekly Eid, so it should have the same ruling of the Eid prayer. We say Eid prayer is not mandatory. It's only communal fard or sunnah. Some Muslims went for Salat al-Eid. That's sufficient. So this should be the same. Is Salat al-Eid replacement of Subh? Or it's different? Different. So it should be different also. That's another thing. So what I want from you really to be able to derive all these rulings, to compare between these ahadith, to see how scholars differed and why. They did not only differ because they liked to, because they had different ahadith, different texts, and they needed to reconcile to see what is stronger. Okay. The person on whom it is obligatory is one who fulfills the conditions for the obligatory for prayer, the discussion of which has preceded, and who meets four conditions. Two of them are agreed upon and two are disputed. Fine. Can you remember this? The two that are agreed upon are being a male and being in sound health. Thus it is not binding upon a woman nor upon a sick person, but if they attend, their Jum'ah prayer would be valid. The disputed conditions are not being a traveler and not being a slave. The majority maintain that the that Jum'ah is not obligatory on them, while Dawood and his disciples maintain that it is obligatory. The reason for disagreement arises from the dispute of the authenticity of the tradition of the tradition related to this issue, which is the saying of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Jum'ah is a duty that is obligatory upon each Muslim living among a group, except for four persons, an own slave, a woman, a minor, and one who is sick. Okay, what do you learn from this hadith? Four persons are exempt. What about the traveler? Is it mentioned here? Does he have to pray or not? He has to, based on this hadith. But again, when you want to establish a ruling, you don't look for one hadith only. Now, in this hadith, those four types are mentioned explicitly. So you know that the slave, does he have to pray Jum'ah? Why? What about prayer, obligatory prayer? Why don't we say he doesn't have to pray also? He is owned slave. That's different. Here, you need to spend lots of time. You need to sit and listen for half an hour, one hour, 20 minutes, whatever it is. You need to go. Because even at their time, even if they had many places to pray, the Jum'ah used to be conducted in one place where everyone gathers. So maybe he needs to take extra time to go there to travel and come back. So he doesn't have to perform Jum'ah. It's not the same with regular prayer. Women, the same thing. Do they have to come for jama'ah? No, the same thing with jama'ah. The sick person, he's excused. <coughs> same thing for coming to the jama'ah. But what about the traveler? That's why it is disputed. From this hadith only, if you look at it, you say yes, he doesn't, uh, he has to pray. But let's see. In another version, the words are except for five, and the words a traveler are added. The tradition has not been deemed authentic by most of Oh, this this is a problem. What do you do here? You're saying this whole hadith is... is uh, yeah. No, uh, it is deemed unauthentic. How can you establish a ruling based on not authentic hadith? How it's raised? Then it became authentic. No, 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 no. No, that particular one may not be presented. No, he said this hadith deemed unauthentic. No, that's addition to the hadith. He's talking about the hadith. But it says to both words that are unauthentic. Yeah. It says both of the scholars, there are some hadith scholars that are unauthentic. Yeah, but, but for most, those most scholars who established the ruling on this hadith, yet they still see this hadith. This happens sometimes. One of the, of the things that elevates the hadith is not only the chain and the text. It is the acceptance by all scholars. 
when, when scholars agree on a ruling and they establish this on a hadith, although the essence of this hadith is weak or it has no strong ground, yet they still apply it. Why? Because the entire ummah accepted the ruling. Regardless of the, the, the hadith itself, the authenticity of the hadith itself. That does not happen always, especially if there is something contradicts it. But we are talking about an issue where there is no contradiction. Yes? Yeah, that's one possibility, yeah. Okay, move on. Conditions for Jummah. Section 2, the conditions of the Jummah. They agree that the conditions for the private prayer are the very conditions determined for obligatory prayers. That is, the eight preceding conditions, except for the time and the call for prayer. For what the, are these conditions? The eight conditions, preceding conditions. Where did they precede? No. Yeah, where we discussed that. Covering the aura. Come on, guys. This is. Yes, these are the conditions. We mentioned that a few chapters ago in the first semester. I won't go there. You, you should go. Okay. Because I may ask you about these conditions. But they disagreed about the. Similarly, they disagreed about the conditions specific for the Friday prayer. What did they disagree here in the Jum'ah? About what? The time of the prayer. <coughs> we will mention this. Go ahead. Go ahead. With respect to the time of the Jum'ah prayer, the majority of the jurors maintain that it, that it is the time for Dhuhr itself, that is, the time of the declining of the sun, and that it is not permitted before the declining of the sun. A group of jurors, including Ahmed ibn Kendall, maintain that it is permitted to observe it before the declining of the sun. Now this is an issue that we have here in Houston. We have it sometimes. The adhan of the dhuhr is at one thirty-five or one thirty-four, while the time for the Juma should start at one thirty. Is that permissible or no? Your mosque. The, do we have to follow your mosque? Actually, that's the opinion of the majority. If you say it is a replacement of Dhuhr, what's the time of Dhuhr? That's the time of Juma. So you cannot start. But there is an opinion for some scholars, including Imam Ahmad Rahimahullah says, no, it is permissible. Why? Yes, there is a hadith. Go ahead, read it. Until after Friday prayer. Likewise, another report says, What does that mean again? What do we have to do with their lunch or nap? Hmm? Yes, it is at that time. The Prophet ﷺ used to have a nap when? Before or after Dhuhr? Before. Before Dhuhr. He used to have short time before Dhuhr. So if they don't have this time until they pray Jumu'ah, that means automatically, when did they pray Jumu'ah? Before Dhuhr. Before the time of the Dhuhr. So they prayed early, like one hour. Okay. Likewise, another report says that they used to pray and return before the walls had cast their shade. And when this happens also? After the Zawal. Because if the sun the zenith is still the peak of its height there is no shade once the sun declines the shade starts coming those who understood from these traditions that the prayer was observed before the declining of the sun permitted it while those who only inter interpreted them to mean just starting with the tadbir how the majority explained those ahadith They said they just merely indicate 
the beginning of the Jum'ah prayer very soon. It doesn't mean that it really happened at that time. What do you think of this explanation? It's clear. This hadith is clear. You could you could explain it. You could. So are you going to go against the majority? Yes. Yes. <laughs> what do you think? Yes. Explain what. Now, in the first hadith, we use not to take nap or lunch until we have Jum'ah. So what? Yes, they used to have this nap and this lunch before Dhuhr. But in Jum'ah in particular, they used to have it after Jum'ah. They start very early. So it doesn't mean that they started before time. Then, if they say until the, there is no shade, it doesn't mean literally there is no shade, but it is. it started soon. So they, they, they started the Jum'ah right after the Adhan of the Dhuhr. They did not wait like 20, 30 minutes. Yes? No, 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 no. They have the nap before Dhuhr. Yeah, always, right? Yeah. But then how could they have Jum'ah after Dhuhr? They don't, they can't. Yeah, that's the evidence for Imam Ahmad. Yeah, yeah, so then that's why you can go against the majority. How, how are they yeah, I understand. The same thing with the next hadith. There is no shade. When the shade happens, after the zenith, after the adhan of the Dhuhr. So if it's before shade, then... Some scholars try to reconcile and they said you can start, you can start before the time. So if we say 135 is the Adhan of the Dhuhr, you can start 125, 120, but you have to finish after the Adhan. So after 135, if we say 135 is the Adhan. And I don't know, it's, it's up to you, whatever you decide. But I have no problem going against the majority against the vast majority as long as there is an authentic evidence. But is it the best thing to do? If you have a choice, always try to eliminate any difference. Well, those who only interpreted the, the mean just starting with the takbir did not commit it, so that the sources may not conflict with each other on this topic. The reason for upholding this interpretation is that it is established through the tradition of Anafi Imani that the Prophet was when the sun had declined. Further, as the Friday prayer is a substitute for the regular Sufa prayer, it is necessary that its time be the time for the Prophet. And that's the opinion of the majority. You say it is replacement of Dhuhr, so it has to be at the same time. You cannot say at one point it is similar, at another point it is not. Therefore, becomes necessary by way of reconciliation to construe those traditions so that they apply to takbir, for they do not indicate explicitly that the time for the Friday prayer starts before the declining of the sun, and that what and that is what the majority see uphold. Okay, and that's what Ibn Rushd rahimahullah himself also tends to say. He goes with the majority also. Okay. Now about the time of the adhan. This is another thing that we have, and it pertains also the, to the time. When do we call for the Adhan, for Jum'ah? Now, if you said it is replacement for Dhuhr, according to Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, yet you still say it could be performed earlier. What time do you call for it? What's this time? Is it replacement of Dhuhr, or it is a new time, time for Jum'ah? And when do you call it? So let's read this issue. The majority of the jurists agree that the time of the Adhan for the Friday prayer starts when the Imam seats himself on at the pulpit. They disagree, however, <coughs> on whether a single Muazzin or more sh should make the call for prayer in front of the Imam. Some of them maintain that only one Muazzin is to make the call while facing the Imam, and this is the call with which, by, which buying and selling are declared prohibited. 
some other jurors said that they should be too lenient and not more for to make the call, while others have said that in fact three of them should make the call. <laughs> How about this? Three muaddins, or two, or one. Which one is the Sunnah? Why they are even discussing this? Based on traditions. There are some traditions where the Muaddin was changed. <coughs> one and two. What about three? Let's see. Go ahead, read. The reason for the disagreement derives from the conflict of tradition about this. It is recorded by Al Bukhari from Al Sa'id. Al Sa'ib ibn Yazid. Al Sa'ib ibn Yazid. And also during the time of Abu Bakr and Amr was made when the Imam had seated himself at the pulpit. When at the time of Uthman the population had increased, a third call was instituted to be delivered from Al Salra. Do you know do you know uh, do you know this? Now <clears throat> usually what's happening nowadays? How many advance do we have? When did this start? That did not start at the time of the Messenger It started at the time of Uthman radiallahu Isn't that innovation? No. Why no? Did the Prophet sallallahu do it? No. Did he ask to be done? Yes. How? He ordered us to follow the Sunnah of the Yeah, he, he ordered us to follow the Sunnah of the Khulafa Rashidin. But he did not give them the authority to do whatever they want. What if they added sixth prayer? Oh, that's good. Now, we need to see. Now, Uthman Radhan did something. Did the Sahaba agree or not? We say yes, because we did not see any apparent objection. But what if some of them did disagreed, but they did not want to, to say it, to keep the Ummah united? See, the pa- basis for this is following the Khulafa, as long as they did not do anything contradicting, they added something, we're commanded to follow them. Just like here. This is, did not happen, this is something that did not happen during the time of the Messenger of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uthman did not do it just because he liked it. It feels good. He did it for a reason. People increased in numbers. So he felt they needed to be informed. So there is the Adhan, earlier Adhan. So how many Adhans do we have? Two. Okay. It's also related from Al Sa'id ibn Yazid that he said. No, no, Sa'id ibn al Musayyib. Oh, okay, yeah, again, another the other hadith. Okay. In the time of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there was only one Ma'adin for the Friday prayer. So this is clear that what? How many Mu'addins? One. one. Simply because you have one Adhan, so you will have one Mu'addin. It is related from and Musayyib. That he said, the call for the Friday prayer during the prayers of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Abu Bakr and Umar used to be a single call when the Imam came out. But when it was the time of Uthman and the population increased, he added to one, the one initial call in order to introduce, induce the people to get ready for Friday, the Friday prayer. Ibn Habib has related that the Mu'adhins during the time of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to be three. A group of jurists followed the apparent meaning of the report by Al Bukhari and maintained that on Friday two muaddins are to make the call. Some of the jurists maintained that there should be a single muaddin. They said that the meaning of the words, when it was time, the time of Uthman and the population increased, a third call was instituted, is that the second call was the Iqam. Uh huh. So it doesn't mean a third call, so a third muaddin. For every call, there is muaddin. When they said thir- three calls, did we have three adhans? No, it is two adhans and one iqama. But they are all called calls. Others adopted what is reported by Ibn Hadid. Although the tradition of Ibn Hadid are weak according to the di- tradition itself, especially those that only he has related. So, what do you think? Which one is stronger? Hmm? One. But if 
more than one did it, it is permissible. Because at the time of the Messenger وسلم, how many adhans were called? One. So how many muaddins? One. Fine, let's add one more adhan, but the same one. Can we uh, have different person? Yes. It should not be actually an issue of disagreement where we make a big deal about it. Okay. Now we have very important issue. Now we said Jum'ah prayer is what? Obligatory according to the majority, vast majority of scholars. And we agreed on the conditions. It is the same as the uh, regular prayer. We know who should perform it. Let's say we came to the class here, and it was Friday. So we need to pray Jum'ah. Can we do that? Here? Yeah. Yes. Why? At least three people. Three men. What if we have two men and ten women? Ten women are not sufficient. So, but if they came, is it accepted or not? They're accepted, but ours is not. Three is enough. No one's accepted, but even three. Okay. According to who? Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah. In a masjid? So, if we gather here in the place and we cannot... So we need to we need to learn our deen from the University of Houston. No, no, what I'm that, no, what I'm <laughs> Maybe what they're doing is wrong. So what? So the the issue here, what's the number of the Jum'ah? Is there a specific number? What about the Jama'ah? Can you pray Jama'ah by your own self? You are individual. What if you and your wife? She's a woman. Why it's different? Uh, yes, exactly. This prayer is obligatory on both. Whether male or female. What about here? It is different. So what's the minimum number for this prayer, Jum'ah prayer? Remember, it's Jum'ah, it's not Jama'ah. Scholars differ. All scholars agreed that there has to be specific number. They agreed on that criteria. There has to be number. But what's that number? That's what scholars disagreed about. Some of them said three. Some of them said twelve. Some of them said forty. So what do you think? Three? America is three. America. So we have rulings for America and we have rulings for subcontinent and too hard? If it's too hard, then you don't pray. We have we have this coming. If it's rural place or if you say it is Three. What's the evidence? Give me an evidence. If you say 12 also, give me an evidence. You cannot just say, why not two? I would say two. Isn't two people enough for jama'ah? <laughs> yes or no? Yes. Why then they are not enough for jama'ah? Yeah. <laughs> What about the one who is giving the Adhan? Isn't he listening also? So isn't it enough one and one? Yes, exactly. That's the argument of the Hanafi school of thought. It is three, the minimum. But is that enough or no? Other scholars said no. Because the Jum'ah is different than other prayers. The minimum has to be twelve. What's their evidence? In the time of the Messenger وسلم, in Surah Al-Jum'ah itself. Fine. 
فَسْعَوْا إِلَى ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَذَرُوا الْبَيْعَ Why this ayah was revealed? Why it was revealed? They were praying. The Prophet ﷺ was giving the khutbah. And a caravan came. So what did the people do? As Allah said, وَإِذَا رَأَوْ تِجَارَةً أَوْ لَهُوًا إِنْ فَضُّوا إِلَيْهَا وَتَرَكُوكَ قَائِمًا they disperse for this business affair and they left you standing. Scholars said, how many people stayed with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Twelve. Did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam start over? No, which means twelve is what? Sufficient. But what, what the Hanafis say? There is no evidence that less than twelve won't be enough. It is just the case. That's what happened. There were 12 people. Another hadith, and that's the opinion of Imam Shafi, rahmanullah, that what's the minimum? 40. The Prophet Wasallam said, the least number is 40. But the problem with that hadith is what? It's not authentic. So the hadith that specifies the number is not authentic. And the hadith that is authentic and specifies the number does not limit it to that number. So we should go back to the origin. But again, it's up to you. Let's read it from the book. No, no, it's the same. 176, the second paragraph. Actually, you see, it is like one page long discussion. It is agreed upon by all. Which is weak. Why weak? Because he's the caller for the prayer. You are the one who's giving the khutbah. You don't give it only to one. There has to be at least one listener. Some said that there should be two persons beside the imam. Some said that there should be three persons beside the imam. This is the opinion of Abu Hanifa. Some of them stipulated. Actually, what's the opinion of Imam Hanifa? Three besides the Imam or two? Okay. Some of them stipulated the presence of 40 persons, which is the opinion of Shafi and Ahmed. While some said there sh should be 30. Some did not fix a number, but said that it should be a number sufficient to establish a seven. Thus, according to this opinion, which was held by Nabi, if Friday prayer is not permissible with three or four persons, the reason for their disagreement stems from their dispute over the minimum number that can be referred to in the plural, plural whether this is three or four or two, and whether the man is in... In two. Arabic, what's the plural? What's the plural? plural? In English, what's the plural? Hmm? More than one, exactly. In Arabic, no. Because we have mufrad, muthanna, we have dual. Dual. In Arabic we have dual. Huma, both of them. And then we have hum, they, plural. So, in the linguistic sense, what's the least number for plural? Three. This is the linguistic. But the religious term, the Prophet ﷺ said, the two and more are what? Jama'ah, they are plural. Two or more. Which means if they are jama'ah, then they are good enough for jama'ah. That's the opinion of Tabari, rahimahullah. Okay. Further, whether the plural for purposes of this prayer is the minimal, minimum that is applied in most cases, which is more than four or three. Those who maintain that the condition here is designation with the minimum to which the plural is applied, and for them the minimum for the plural is two, said that the jama'ah is valid with two persons. The imam and another. This was the view of those who included the imam in the count. But if they were among those who did not include the imam in the count, they held that it is valid with two persons beside the imam. For those whom the minimum for plurality was three, and they were not including the imam in the count, said that the juma, that juma is valid with three persons beside the imam. All these opinions are related to the linguistic definition of 
plural. Two, but is it two with the imam or without the imam? Is it with the imam, the madhin? So that's not the issue. What about those who have 12 and 40? Based on the evidences that I mentioned. So this is the, the, the issue of the number. It is an issue. Scholars differed. According to some scholars, you're giving the khutbah, you have 10 people, but it is invalid according to them. The next issue we have, the residency. Do you have to be resident? So if you're a traveler, are you exempt from the Jummah or not? If you travel, do you have to pray or you're exempt? You have to pray. Do you have to pray Dhuhr? Is this alternative for Dhuhr? Huh. What? What do you say? Is the Jummah prayer alternative for Dhuhr or no? So now you say special? It's always. So, do you have to pray or no? That's the question. If you're a traveler. Why? What hadith? It's weak. That's fasting. We're talking about prayer. And it, fasting is different. This is, this is incorrect uh, qiyas because you have to make it up. Do you make up the Jummah when you come back? No. So you cannot make this analogy. Well, well traveling you combine Dhuhr and Asr. Yeah. So, so because it's like it's it's um, a blessing from Allah making it easy on you when you're traveling or leave. And so having to go and find the masjid and you know try to find it and it's difficult. Yeah. Was it ever reported that the Prophet ﷺ performed Jummah during his traveling? Never. Never. Yeah, but what about Arafah? Didn't he give a speech in Arafah? Is that speech for Jummah? Because it was Friday. No, he was traveling. So there is, there is, let's read it, let's read it. Jurists agreed about this because of their agreeing that the Friday prayer is not obligatory for a traveler. This is opposed to Friday Zahir. So the actually all four Imams said what? You don't perform it. The argument came from the Zahiriya. That does not mean it's only weak. Actually they have strong opinion sometimes, but it's based on the evidences. This is opposed by the Zahirites who hold that the so it's not only settlement. There has to be also what? Government. Why why this is stipulated? It's very important. Again, the Jummah prayer is is a reflection of power. So imagine at their time if forty people decided to isolate themselves. And they said, we will have our jama'ah, we will have our jama'ah, and that's it. Imam Hanif said, no, there has to be authority. So it's not only the number, it's not only the residency. In some, in some times, again, because of its jama'ah prayer, it is significant. Some scholars said it is not even allowed to give another jama'ah without the permission of the imam. He has to authorize that the jama'ah is to be given there. Because in principle, it should be made in one place only, one location. Okay. But he did not stipulate the number. The reason for disagreement is this matter arises. This matter arises from whether or not the circumstances prevailing at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam held this prayer or to be considered as conditions for the validity or for the obligation of this prayer. It happened that the Prophet ﷺ always observed this prayer in a congregation in a permanent settlement, meaning village or town, and in a central masjid. Those who made so if the Prophet ﷺ did it all the time there, does that mean it cannot be done with, without these conditions or it's just happened and it doesn't mean that if it did not happen this way, it's not valid or it's not mandatory? The Prophet ﷺ always did it in residency. 
Does that mean it cannot be outside? You could say this, but you need further evidence. Those who maintain that the linking of these surroundings with his prayer renders them, them conditions for the private prayer stipulated their existence as a condition. Those who link only some of these elements with the private prayer stipulated only these as conditions to the exclusion of others. This is like the stipulation by Malik of observe, observing it in a masjid and dropping the condition that it should take place in a permanent settlement and that there should be a ruling authority. So some scholars looked at all the things that the Prophet ﷺ did. If any one of them is missing, then the Jum'ah is not mandatory. The Prophet ﷺ performed the Jum'ah always in masjid. So we don't perform the Jum'ah if we don't have masjid. Prophet ﷺ performed the Jum'ah always in residency. So if we don't have residency, we don't perform the Jum'ah. Others said no. Some of them are conditions. Others, they just happened like that. That's what it means. And we will stop here, inshallah. We'll continue the discussion next session. Is there any questions? If he was not obligatory, and Prophet never did it, mm -hmm. is it bid'ah to do it when you're traveling? No, it's not bid'ah. <laughs> that does not mean it is bid'ah. Okay. Can you pray for raka'ah of prayer if you're a traveler? You can, you can pray too. What if you wanted to pray the full four? Is it bid'ah? No. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it is there. I can, I can get it for you. Sure. The call for the Adhan, yeah. Isn't reciting the Quran an act of worship? The, there is an exception for the companions, yes, or the, so especially those four companions, okay. Khalifa al Rashidin. So he considered their actions sunnah. Okay. So okay. it is not, it will never so be bid'ah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any questions from students online?